We are live. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, to Worldwide Neuro and the Oxford Neuro Theory Forum. Uh, my name is Tim Vogels. I'm a associate professor at the University of Oxford, and it's my distinct pleasure today uh, to introduce to you Kay Kai. Uh, before I do, uh, I just want to make you aware of the features that Crowdcast offers. You probably all know them. We have a chat um, bar on your right hand side that you can uh, voice your enthusiasm uh, through or with um, or smaller questions that you think the audience may be able to answer for you. Uh, then there's also an add a question uh, button on the lower um, end of your screen at the bottom that you can ask more complex questions for uh, Kay to answer at the end of her talk. Um, when you write those questions, make sure that you add enough content or context uh, so that we know exactly what you were talking about, what po point of the talk you raised the question for. Um, and also, if you want to be invited on screen, uh, add a plus on screen. Otherwise, I'll have to assume you want me to read that question for you at the end of the talk. Um, so without, uh, with, with that in the bag, uh, and without uh, much introduction, uh, I offer to you today uh, Kay Tai, uh, who was an undergrad at MIT and did her grad school at UCSF, um, and then returned, uh, well, did a postdoc at Stanford, um, and then returned to MIT as a professor, where uh, she made a name for herself uh, for um, looking at valence coding, uh, in animals and um, also for the techniques she used, so uh, nifty optogenetics. Um, I think today we're going to hear about nifty optogenetics, but not about valence coding. Is that right? Um, I don't know. Uh, what I do know is uh, the talk is brand new. Uh, Kay has been preparing that talk for you uh, pretty much all night. Um, and, um, and so uh, she warned me that it might be a little rough on the edges, but I think that's kind of neat uh, because usually uh, we get the not so rough talks online. So it's quite brave uh, that you're here with new and unpublished stuff and I'm looking very much forward to it. So thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me, Tim. It's really an honor to be here. Um, and I will start screen sharing. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for joining us this morning or evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, it's really exciting to uh, be here today, although the only appropriate way that I feel that we should start uh, is to just, I just want to start with a public service announcement slash opinion. Um, there's lots of things that I could use this time for, but I just want to take a quick moment to discuss why Black Lives Matter is the most logical message, um, because they're... This is the minimal correction that we can do to account for the enormous and unquantifiable accumulation of disadvantages that Black people in America experience in their lifetime. Uh, we already seem to know that white lives matter, so therefore Black Lives Matter is the only new non-redundant information that we need to communicate and internalize as a general overall global population. So. Um, I know it's been it's been a difficult week for many of us, and um, certainly been difficult for me to focus on science this week. But uh, I do feel extremely excited to unleash uh, to unveil this project. It is completely new, and I don't think um, it's been a long time since I've given a seminar that is this much unpublished data that I've never discussed before. So hopefully you'll bear with me. Um, I could have done a, a more polished talk, but uh, I just wanted to talk about something that I was excited about and get feedback. Um, I, I, I definitely saw at least Nancy Badia in the chat room here. So if you have any questions about the details of the experiments, she'll likely be able to answer them. And um, we'll just dive right in here. So the question that I'm really passionate about understanding is what are the neural circuit mechanisms underlying the maintenance of stable social hierarchies? There are many, many different species uh, on the planet and many of the most successful species on this planet have intricate, rich social hierarchical structures that 
somehow manage to maintain stability, even in the face of changing environmental conditions or changing internal composition. And what happens to make a social hierarchy destabilize and restabilize? And so these are the big, big, big questions that we're interested in. But this is extremely difficult to tackle. And um, the reason that um, this is an area that has um, historically been focused on in other fields of behavioral ecology, ethology, um, zoology, but it's been really challenging to really bridge the gap between um, ethology and social hierarchies and neuroscience because of the vast amount of unconstrained variables. So I'll talk about some of those challenges as well um, because really we've been working on setting up this platform for about five years. And um, right now, that's why this is such an exciting moment, um, things are really coming together for the first time. So first, I wanna start with a term that you're probably already familiar with, homeostasis. What is homeostasis? And this is just um, coming from the Greek word for same and steady, and is referring to any process that organisms use to actively maintain stable conditions necessary for survival. And so there's um, some several, several very rich and beautiful bodies of work um, in neuro, neuroscience dissecting homeostatic systems for energy balance or hunger, thermoregulation, osmoregulation. Um, there's a lot more to be done on, on these uh, systems, but if you can imagine uh, how this works. So let's take the example of thermoregulation. What do we need for that? You need to detect the ambient temperature or your body temperature, I should say, your body temperature. Compare that to 98.6 degrees, your set point. And then if you are above or below that, then you um, call upon effector systems, glands, maybe you start sweating, maybe you move into the shade, um, whatever, to cool your body if you are too hot. And then this corrects the change which is in the environment. So that's sort of your, you know, boilerplate example for homeostasis in general. And what we are really interested in, oops, sorry about that. What we are really interested in is how social homeostasis happens. And I hope you can imagine already, just as soon as I say that, uh, first of all, intuitively, that there is homeostasis, uh, social homeostasis. Um, you can detect a deficit in social contact or a surplus, and there is some optimal point. Not everybody has that same same uh, control center set point. But even at the detector level, detecting the quality and quantity of social um, gestures and signals, who they come from, how does this inter interface with social rank, um, does your set point depend on social rank, all of these things are questions that we're interested in. So just this is kind of the, the um, overall 30,000 foot view. And so uh, I want to start by telling you about some of Jillian Matthews' uh, previous work. Um, Jillian is, uh, was started my lab as a postdoc and now is a senior staff scientist and is more than ready to have her own lab. In fact, she ran my lab at MIT when we left and did an amazing job. And uh, Jillian is on the faculty job market right now, particularly interested in Britain. The UK is is her you know target zone, and I can't say enough about Jillian. I mean, she could have had a, a, a faculty job years ago, and has just been so passionate and committed to the science that um, there's been a lot of other work uh, that she that, that's coming up in the pipeline from Jillian. And so much of the conceptual framework, um, the initial ideas, uh, Jillian really was the intellectual driving force. So I want to stress that. Um, okay. So just to briefly summarize what uh, Jillian found, uh, this is published work, so I'm gonna breeze through this real quick, but basically um, there are these dopamine neurons in the dorsal raphe nucleus. Most people think about serotonin neurons in the dorsal raphe nucleus, but there are also dopamine neurons there. And um, they're much less studied. What Jillian discovered serendipitously is that when you socially isolate an adult mouse for 24 hours, you see a robust increase in glutamatergic synaptic strength coming on to these deer and dopamine neurons. Further, when we isolate an animal for 24 hours, their response, um, if, we, if we look at uh, bulk, bulk calcium fluorescence using a genetically encodable calcium indicator, we can see that the neural response of these deer and dopamine neurons is amplified when uh, mice have been isolated and then reintroduced to a social agent. So this is all just to say that deer and dopamine neurons are sensitive to acute social isolation. Um, 
Next, you know, we wanted to do some, as Tim called it, nifty optogenetics. And we're just, you know, probing the system and we photostimulate these neurons and we see, interestingly, an increase in pro-social behavior, but also animals don't uh, prefer the stimulation. They avoid it. They will avoid places that are paired with photostimulation. And this really had our, us scratching our heads um, about what this could mean. Um, we also did photo inhibition, and Jillian initially did this with group house animals, or excuse me, with with ice uh, group house animals. Yes, as, as as was here. But then when she uh, photo inhibited, there wasn't really an effect. Only when animals were acutely isolated um, was she able to block this rebound of this isolation induced rebound of social interaction. So when animals are isolated and you reintroduce them to a social group, there's this rebound of social interaction and this is blocked by silencing deer and dopamine neurons. So um, if we liken this to other homeostatic systems like energy balance, um, you know, you can think about eating for, for reward. There's food reward. It's just palatable and delicious and it's creme brulee is yummy. I don't really need it. Um, that is eating, you know, that is eating for food reward. Alternatively, you could be eating to avoid the unpleasant state of hunger. And this would be a homeostatic need state drive, uh, drive state, excuse me. Um, so similarly, you can socialize for social reward or you can um, seek social contact to escape the unpleasant state of social isolation, which for many, many species has been shown to be aversive. So we we're doing this and um, we're checking, checking our work with uh, the psychological literature. Specifically, I'm thinking of um, John Cachopo and others and Bob Wester and Leary. But um, what are the criteria for quote unquote loneliness in, if, 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 by the psychological definition? And there were a number of criteria um, that were met. Some of them are included here. Included here. And one, the, the most challenging one to tackle was that loneliness is subjective. It, you know, you can be lonely in a crowded street, um, or you can feel not alone when you are when you are by yourself. And so um, that is the most challenging thing. It's a very subjectively perceived and um, not necessarily directly correlated with your environment. So how are we going to even get at this in, in a mouse. There's all these different social, you know, social stimuli could just be more salient and more arousing. What what can we possibly think about to, have, to try to get at its subjectivity? And so what we did was, um, you know, this is not perfect, but I think it's a reasonably good proxy, um, was that we looked at the social rank of all these different animals. And this is, I'm about, I'm about to say something that's like wild speculation, but I would speculate that if you're in a group of animals and you are the dominant mouse and then suddenly you're isolated, that might be an aversive experience for you. But if you were the subordinate mouse and constantly being, you know, deprived of, of primary res of prime resources and being, you know, attacked all the time, maybe when you feel when you're isolated, you feel great and feel safe and you know not not you feel differently and so this is the idea behind this examination of social rank and what we found was that all of the epigenetic manipulations that we did were strongly correlated with social rank and the effects that we were seeing are driven um largely by the dominance okay so the take-home message of this study is that um these drn dopamine neurons may re represent an effector system for social homeostasis. And so, and, uh, and we also recently replicated this effect in humans in a preprint um, that just came out, um, you know, a couple months ago. So I think that's always nice to see um, that there could be some relevance to humans and common circuitry. Okay, so I showed you a simple diagram of homeostasis just a moment ago. Now I want to think about you know, I, I said to you, yes, this this is a complex system, certainly, um, but it's going to be even more complex for social homeostasis. And let me sort of try to break that down for you. So we've got our detector, our control center, our effector um, systems, and then this response, just like normal. But um, within the detector system, there's a couple of different possibilities. And so, you know, there are far more questions than I'm even listing here, but here are some very clearly defined uh, testable hypotheses. So in one case, you know, recognition of the individual, which um, 
maybe a partially non-overlapping set of, of neurons representing rank and identity could either feed directly into the de detector system, meaning, you know, if, if someone who is my employee versus someone who is my boss makes the exact same gesture towards me, I would interpret that very differently. And why is that? Is that happening at the detector level or is it happening at the control center level? Where is this um, waiting? Where is this uh, out, this computation happening in the implementational circuitry, if that makes any sense, drawing from Mars conceptual framework? Okay, so um, focusing on this question, right, we don't even know this. Is it, it's totally possible that uh, rank and identity are represented by completely non-overlapping ensembles of neurons. It's also possible that um, they are partially non-overlapping, or even that rank is a subset of the many features and make up an individual's identity. And so these are some questions that we are interested in. Then it only gets more complicated when you think about what is happening at the control center. How do you decide what you need to do? Um, and uh, how do you prioritize all the different things? If you're a little bit hungry and a little bit thirsty, a little bit hot and you know isolated, how do you determine and how do you orchestrate all these competing mechanisms to select the, the single behavioral output that you're going to execute? Um, and then also, of course, we're interested in the effector system. How is this happening? Are there two different parallel effector systems? One that looks at uh, internal effector systems and one that looks at external effector systems? Or is this, in, is this happening in parallel? Or is this happening serially? Um, in terms of, for example, you know, sweating versus moving to the shade for the, for, um, the analogy to thermoregulation. Okay, so this is, these uh, concepts are kind of laid out in a review that Jillian um, um, wrote and I supported. I just hung out and cheered her on and scribbled on, on the whiteboard, but uh, Jillian wrote a beautiful review that really outlines these concepts. Okay, so as I mentioned at the beginning, um, there have been a lot of challenges in, in the research of, neural, of the neural basis of social behavior. I mean, there's been a lot of beautiful work done on reductionist behaviors, myself included. I, I was trained um, you know, in a behavioral neuroscience background with very controlled tasks and, you know, very reductionist behaviors that we have a lot of experimental control and statistical power. Um, and, but, um, you know, this hasn't allowed us to really expand. And so, you know, we've done some, some more straightforward um, work on social behavior in the past. Many other groups have done tremendous, uh, tremendous, you know, projects and, and it's like it's way more than that it's a very deep field and you know the social defeat field is very deep there's a lot that's been done but a lot of times it's just about you know one animal and then this experimental stimulus there's extremely li limited literature on the neural circuitry of social dominance um i think the the lab that has inspired me the most in terms of thinking about social rank and dominance is uh hylan who's lab and so um her work has been hugely influential for me um, and also uh, Bernardo Sabatini. So the big question is, how are we going to fill this gap between behavioral ecology and, you know, this really rigorous circuit dissection neuroscience that we have been doing? So um, one thing that we're thinking about is looking at animals uh, while they're engaging in both classic assays for rank, like the tube test. This has been well validated, uh, particularly by Highland Who's Lab, as well as just free home cage behaviors. Um, and we're very inspired by our collaborator, James Curley, who looks at large groups of animals as mice in the wild live in groups of 15 or 20, um, not so different from human group sizes, classrooms, sports teams, departments, etc. And so I think that has been a really exciting and insightful collaboration with James. So today, um, what I want to focus on is, are the following. First, I want to share with you all the challenges to studying an ethological behavior with quantitative rigor because it is something that we have spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, and then, of course, I want to dig into the results, specifically how do PFC neurons represent social rank. Um, from Hylan Hu's work, we already know that the MPFC, the medial prefrontal cortex, is important for social rank, but how does it actually 
encode this and where do these neurons send information? So the first challenge that we have is to be able to use, um, to be able to take rich behaviors and quantify them. So I'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly. There's this um, beautiful, uh, this tool from Bob Data's lab that, and that is really great, allows um, sort of unsupervised clustering of behavioral motifs that has inspired us. And then there's these semi-supervised machine learning mechanism uh, methods. And um, I'll just list them here. I think uh, probably the, the best known one at this point and the one that we've used the most is Deep Lab Cut. Um, uh, Mackenzie, Mathis, and Matthias Street have, have really pushed this forward and it's been, it's been transformative. Um, and then there's been, there's AlphaPose. Uh, and this is gonna be the skeleton of which we build this new computational uh, vision, computer vision tool. So, okay, I'm gonna skip these um, for the time being because I'm running a little short on time and I'll just talk to you first about how we wanted to get around this because um, when we were tackling this, we found that it a lot of these uh, computer vision tools work well for one mouse, but they don't work great for multiple black mice on poor contrast when they're all climbing all over each other. And we saw this, um, actually, Rui Han uh, Zhang, who was a visiting student in my lab um, a few years back, was actually the person to initiate this collaboration um, between our lab and Si Lu's lab. And so based on this, I'll first, just, first I'm going to show you this new tool that this is really the unveiling of this new tool as well. Uh, we were, we are, we're hoping to have a preprint out very soon. Um, but uh, for now, I'll just show you what it does. So Deep Lab Cut is great, and we, we use it for a lot of other projects. But as you can see here, when we have these two mice, um, there's a lot of, of errors in terms of the identity switching. We have not tried the new version of Deep Lab Cut yet, so that is absolutely a disclaimer and uh, we need to do that. But this is where we were, you know, four or five years ago when we started building this tool. Um, you know, not, not that long. Deep Lab Cut is newer than that, but we uh, realized we needed a tool and th this is how it performs. So if you look at Alpha Tracker here, you can see that. Um, we don't get these these identity switch errors where the two tail bases are being flipped or, or tracking on, on reflections. And um, if we, so I can show you this movie, these are the exact same frames. Um, they're not synchronized in time because of my competence in using Keynote, but <laughs> these are the same exact frames. Okay, and if we take the same frames and match for training um, and match for inputs, you can see here that um, what we've got here is, is, is the number of errors that we're seeing for the images that we're showing. Negligible errors are shown here. This is basically human error. Um, open circles are an identity switch um, rather than you know tr tracking a reflection or something else. And you can see that um, a lot of these errors are really uh, we see with deep lab cut, we don't see with alpha tracker. And while there are still some errors, they are approaching uh, what we would say is like optimum human performance. And this number, you know, pixels is going to depend on the resolution of the footage. But I think um, this plot made us pretty excited about, about this tool. I also want to show you that even if you, the, the, one of the things that's really exciting, and, and we shared some transfer learning um, components in, this, in the backbone of this tool, um, when you train on two mice, it, it still works on four. So this here we've trained uh, the network with with videos of just two mice, and we've never shown it four mice before. Yet it does pretty well. Also, we can train on nice videos and then take videos from before these technologies existed, from like you know, ten years ago. These low resolution footage, uh, low resolution videos, and you can see that Alpha Tracker is still able to um, track pretty well this low contrast low resolution video without training on similar contrast or similar resolution. And so um, basically what we're seeing here, we're, we're measuring a lot of different features and then creating behavioral clusters. Um, you know, this is definitely inspired by Bob, Bob Daz's tool, Mosik. Um, but what we wished is that we could have these clusters and then be able to uh, 
assign, name them and then still get sort of like a timestamp for all these different behavioral motifs, even if we don't want to be biased a priori going in expecting what they are. So this is just kind of a, a really, really rough cut. We're working on the GUI. It's going to be prettier soon, but just shows you how it functions. What we can do here is march through this cluster, the hierarchical clustering, either in 2D or here. And you can see this point is matching this particular line here. And what we're looking at are a number of different clips. Uh, looks like maybe I would, I would, you know, label this, this um, motif whatever whatever rearing or climbing and then you can go and um have each of these behavioral motifs be laid out in timestamps for your footage and give you some rich uh, quantitative data that is also allows you the ability to um, discover you know behavioral motifs through this unsupervised approach so um, basically, you know, it, what, what have we done to make this work? Um, we've used a YOLO-based object detection bounding box, and this just keeps the identity switches from happening. We use a squeeze and excitation SPPE-based feature detection. Uh, then we have post pr proposals and consider the previous frame. Um, and so these are some of the, the add-ons that we um, have implemented um, that are different from Deep Lab Cut. Okay, so that was challenge number one. We're really excited about that tool. We hope other people use it, but mainly we just wanted to be able to do these experiments. Um, the next challenge is to create a task that doesn't have motor confounds or set sensory motor confounds that enables statistical comparison of neural dynamics. So, um, you know, from my training, the easiest way to do this is to have a trial structure. And um, this brings me to the beginning of uh, this brand new story. So this is like, I'm like nervous to, I hope I don't embarrass Nancy. Uh, Nancy is an incredibly talented postdoc. I'm extremely fortunate to have recruited her. She came to me from Josh Gordon's lab and uh, there was lots of competition to recruit her. And she came to the lab and started so many new technologies, completely fearless um, and, and, you know, probably 50% of what Nancy's accomplished isn't even gonna be part of the story. She has really seeded so many new directions and um, you know, new projects and directions and really a subfield um, in, in the time that she's been in my lab and I couldn't be more impressed. Nancy is also potentially on the job market this fall um, and I would strongly encourage that if you are potentially interested in recruiting Nancy that you contact her sooner than later. Um, so, okay, the reward competition task that Nancy developed um, is really this, this effort that we were trying to have this neural ecological investigation of social rank, but with a trial structure. So first we um, establish ranks using, you know, kind of field standard uh, assays like the tube test. Basically, we put animals in a, in a tube, we train them to only want to go forward. Maybe this models like the action in the burrow, you're facing off with someone in a narrow hallway. And you know, do you get do you move to the side? Or do you do you walk? And um, the dominant typically is the one that makes its way through the tube. And um, this has been uh, cross validated with other assays for social rank as well. So then we train the animals really, really simple. There's a cue. There's a condition stimulus that predicts a reward delivery in an adjacent port. Really simple. And they do this, you know, this is just Pavlovian conditioning. Um, and you can see the animals, regardless of rank, are all learning this task pretty well. And they're all performing equally when they're alone. Um, and then we take two cage mates with established social, relative social ranks and put them in there to compete for the rewards. And so um, we were happy to see that, uh, you know, this cross-validated with with other measures of, of dominance. So now we know that this task is reflecting dominance behavior. Dominant animals win more, they occupy the port more, um, they push more and are successful more when they push and um, are displaced less often. So all of these are sort of what we would consider dominance behaviors in this novel reward competition task. And there are many different um, variations of this task, most of which I won't have time to get into, but if you have questions, that'll give me an excuse to talk about it. Okay, so um, third, the other challenge is that recording from many different animals, when they're all crawling on top of each other, makes it extremely challenging. Um, 
so we need to be able to record wirelessly. Um, Javier Weddington, who I'll uh, tell you a little bit more about in just a moment, um, worked hard on on finding a way to not tangle the tangle tethers, but uh, you know that doesn't. It's even with there, we decided wireless was worth it. So even with the short shorter battery life, um, the tangling is is kind of unworkable and, and impairs behavior. So what we are using in collaboration with Matthias Carlson, I'm sorry, that is a typo. There are two T's in Matthias Carlson's uh, name, and he is, has helped us incredibly with these spike gadgets, mini loggers um, that are wireless uh, um, electrophysiological recording devices that um, keep the data logged on the head. And um, we worked with him brainstorming how we were going to interface this with photo tagging. And, um, you know, this is just another one of those technological that Nancy blazed through like it was nothing. So very impressive. And uh, um, this this task, this is what it looks like when the animals are in there. Um, those, I know the head, head caps look pretty big, but we've done some quantification and it doesn't affect um, their behavior when they are alone. Um, and so this was a group effort. Um, of course, Nancy uh, played a huge role in this. Javier Weddington, um, a former technician in my lab, also did a lot of work with a lot of, uh, you know, kind of the initial bushwhacking, piloting out different things, figuring out what, what works and what doesn't, exploring the vast parameter space. And we tried a lot of things that didn't work. Um, so, you know, I think that's really critical. And, and he also played a critical role in getting this to work. And so Javier Weddington is now at Stanford and um, looking forward to seeing what happens next. Uh, Mackenzie Paterino has been essential and, you know, in terms of data collection of the recent data sets um, is definitely, you know, doing the heavy lifting um, with the data I'm about to show you now. Okay, so first there are a bunch of different types of trials. Um, you can win. And so here, I'm gonna show you an example of where this animal wins. This animal's trying to contest, attempting to displace, um, but uh, they fail to displace this animal. Um, there's also other types of wins where the other animal is not contesting. Um, animals can also lose. So um, this is an example of a, a, a lose trial. The cue is presented. This sort of triggers the uh, availability and you know this animal is not collecting the reward. And that's a passive loss. Um, and then there's the example of um, when the when the animals enter the port during the tone and it's themselves, that's one trial type. So this is, you know, right now we're pretending we are the, this is the self animal, the blue animal. Um, and then we also want to look at what happens in the blue animal's brain when the yellow animal, this, this other mouse, um, is entering the port. So what happens when uh, the competitor is getting a reward? Hmm. Okay, we also look at both of these trial types um, in the intertrial interval um, when there is no cue. So this is probably like, you know, the animals really sort of know that the, the, there's low likelihood of there being reward, but they're just checking it out in case. And um, that's that's been interesting to look at too. I don't know if I'll have much time to talk about it, but um, we'll see. So basically what we are doing is taking all of these different trial types and um, um, We'll do a couple of different things with them. We'll first, the first thing that we do is take all the units that we've recorded um, across, concatenate all the different trial types and um, basically take trial average data, perform principal co component analysis, your standard dimensionality reduction, um, uh, you know, transformation. And then um, we're going to do a couple of different things with this. So the first thing that we'll do is uh, look at look at the um, neural trajectories. And so, again, what we're thinking about here is that if, I mean, I didn't do a very good job of explaining this. Let me try again. So, so if, you, if you're unfamiliar with this visualization tool, which has been really common, uh, really popularized by, uh, I would say, John Cunningham and Mark Churchland, in particular, at least they've inspired me the most, um, and Hila Feet, our collaborator, who has been instrumental in thinking about this. Um, uh, what we want to do is be able to see what a large ensemble of neurons is doing without cherry picking certain neurons or, or anything like that. So how do we see this? And if you think about what an ensemble is, you could 
consider making each neuron a dimension. So say you have 400 neurons, then you could plot the trajectory of the ensemble in 400 dimensional space. But obviously that's extremely difficult to visualize in our three dimensional world. So what we can do is um, use principal components to reduce down to the, to the, um, the, the things that cause the most covariance and then use those dimensions, those PCs, um, to look at the data. So I should have done a better job the first time. Okay, so now we're looking at the principal components one and two. And um, the way that we're visualizing this is here's the start of the trajectory, which is baseline, and um, uh, the Q onset and then the trajectory end. So the Q continues after the end of the trajectory, but um, open circles are going to be subordinates, closed circles are going to be dominants, and blue is, is a wind trial, red is a loss trial. So I know this is a lot, and we'll, we'll talk through this. Um, so first, you can see, okay, this, this trial is going like this, and um, these, these white dots indicate 50 millisecond bins. So if this is showing you that the, there's a lot more distance traveled within this trajectory after the queue begins. So in a wind trial, there's some, there's some trajectory, and then it accelerates once the queue uh, it has an onset. And this is again um, in a subordinate animal, subordinate animal win. If we look at a subordinate animal loss trial, it looks, um, you know, so, there's some similarities. It's, it's in a different starting point, which I think is interesting to, to say. Um, and then, but also does accelerate um, when, when the queue onset occurs. So just imagine, you know, that this is, again, this is in state space. So we anchor these trajectories together with dominant animals. And you can see here, this is a dominant animal path, um, qualitatively different. Um, and, and this is their loss path, uh, you know, relatively little distance traveled, um, perhaps indicating not very much dynamic, not, not a lot of dynamic changes occurring in this ensemble um, on this trial type. And so, um, I'll, I'll first speculate about this a little bit. Um, so one way to think about this, uh, one way that you might think about this is that, um, you know, when you look at the animal behaving, the dominant animal's losses, many of these loss trials are when the dominant animal is not really attending. They're not necessarily competing um, for those loss trials. They're often having passive losses. Um, and so perhaps there's, this just is consistent with, with reduced engagement. Um, but what we can say about this is, first, there's something to consider about uh, the distance between these trajectories. So the distance would be the, you know, the distance between them. How far apart are they in space um, at each at each uh, time point, at each bin? And alternatively, we can also look at the length of the trajectory. How much is it actually traveling, um, you know, of, um, basically summing all the distances from each 50 millisecond bin. Okay. So um, these uh, th these plots are showing you the length. And what you can see is that what screams out is that, first of all, subordinates have a huge delta in the before Q is on and during a winning trial for a subordinate um, relative to a dominant. So these are all win trials, but dominance before the Q onset and during the Q onset, there's a relatively small change in distance traveled, where as this is pretty um, significant, this is pretty massive, relatively speaking, for the subordinates. And then similarly for a loss trial, you also see this pattern, but to a lesser extent. And so I think what what another speculation that we're starting to think about is maybe this is indicative of um, the subordinate subordinate um, neural activity representing what happens um, more dynamically than dominant animals. So we can also look at the win versus loss distance. How different is the neural representation of a win trial versus a loss trial? And you know, I can't help but notice the, the, um, this overall pattern of loss, losses being in this part of the state space and wins being in this part of the state space. But even so, you can see that here we're plotting the distance so how far apart these are for the subordinates and for the dominance. And you can see that the subordinates are significantly higher, even at the beginning. And then uh, this change becomes um, magnified once the Q onset uh, begins. So 
So um, I've talked to you about win-loss trials. Now I want to talk to you about what happens when the animal enters the port versus the animal watches another animal enter the port. Um, some people have called these mirror neurons. Um, you, that's, I'm, I'm sort of agnostic about terminology at this point. I'm just thinking about, um, you know, what, what is the, you know, what is happening in one mouse's brain when it's watching another animal do the same thing versus when it does it itself. And so if we can look at this, uh, these trajectories, I'm going to blow them up for you here just so that we can see what's going on and rotate them a little bit to give you a better angle in the third, the third PC to be visible. Um, but you can see here that, uh, again, we see this, this divide. It's not the same as wins and losses. This is different. This is, this is um, self and other entry. So that is reminiscent, not exactly the same, but you see the same pattern. And again, dominants have this uh, sh characteristic shorter um, trajectory and uh, subordinates are way over here. Once again, when we quantify the same things I just told you about length, you see the same overall pattern that um, subordinates have more activity, but it's notable here in contrast to wins and losses, um, before entry versus self-entry, um, the, the, the length is, is very high in both cases here. So um, once again, the same pattern, uh, other versus self, this diverges as, uh, as we approach the port entry and subordinates um, have a greater distance between other and self, meaning the neural representation of other and self port entries is more different in uh, subordinates. Okay, so that's a lot of different stuff to say, but really, um, if PFC neurons truly represent social rank, then we should be able to decode rank from neural data alone. And I think the other question is, when exactly is rank encoded or, de or it, you know, when is it being represented? Is it being represented during competition when the rank is super relevant, like when the queue comes on? Is it being represented all the time? Um, that Those are some questions that we're interested in. So again, we're doing this same um, principal component uh, strategy here. We're going to take some trial average data for all these different trial types um, and then uh, put those features in, have labels, do some cross-validation, in this ca case, a tenfold. Then we have our training data set to train the model, and then we have uh, our test data set, which, of course, was left out of the training data set, kind of your standard SVM. Um, uh, and I also want to acknowledge Zhang Chang for um, doing sort of the first version of this, even though uh, this, is, this is slightly different. Okay, so... What we found that was really striking, so here we have on the y-axis um, performance and area under the curve. Um, this inset just, just uh, quantifies the baseline versus Q onset data here. Um, and then this is just showing us the trial, the time in the trial. So right here is when the Q goes on, and this is just you know the intertrial interval baseline data, and then the Q is being, being played here. Um, and I thought it was really interesting, uh, surprising, that we got such high decoding accuracy because, you know, this is chance. Essentially, 50% is chance. Um, and this is, you know, compared to some of the other work that we've done where we look at single neuron decoding accuracy, this is way higher. And I think it's also quite striking that the PFC neurons are able to decode wins and losses at, at you know, like 80, 80 plus uh, percent accuracy um, before the cue is even played, before the win has even happened, and so I thought that was that was really interesting. And you know, this this the implication is that you're in a winning or losing mindset, and you know you're ready or not to compete when the cue is being played. So that's one speculative interpretation of of these data, but I think um, it's sort of just exciting to see that it, it can significantly decode wins and losses. Um, perhaps even more mind blowing is that, um, cause you know, I guess I would have predicted that the PSC is gonna decode wins and losses better than it's gonna decode rank because, you know, wins and losses is what's happening right now, trial by trial. Um, and, you know, that was, that, was, that was just my sort of null hypothesis. My null hypothesis was wrong. And actually the accuracy for decoding relative rank is way higher um, for uh, decoding rank 
rather than wins and losses. And this is even like really at the 90% level of decoding relative rank, even in the ITI, even when the animals aren't, aren't, there's no reward available to be competed for. So I thought that was pretty surprising and, and exciting. So this kind of, you know, tells us, I'm sorry, I, I can't see what slide six. So I'm really, this is my brand new slide that like I haven't memorized yet. But, um, but the take home message here is that we can get these, um, the PSC can decode wins and losses and rank, and that it, it decodes rank with super high accuracy even before they're competing. But this is all like really, you know, um, there's been a lot of dimensionality reduction, a lot of transformations in the data. Um, what about the raw data? And that's, you know, usually where I start. Um, so first what we, we did is, as before, I was telling you how we took all the uh, trial average data and concatenated the trial types, wins, losses, um, port entries of the self when the queue is playing, port entries of the other mouse when the queue is playing, port entries of self and other when there is no no queue playing and no, no indication of reward. And um, we can uh, create a heat map here. The Z score is represented by color. So uh, warmer colors are higher Z scores, excitations, and cooler colors are um, lower, lower firing rates and um, inhibitions. So this is all Z score. So it's all normalized data, not raw firing data. So maybe raw data was a bit slight, you know, misleading descriptor, but this is uh, pretty close to that. You can see what all the different neurons are doing. And then if we pull them apart and look at dominance versus subordinates, um, you see a lot of similarities, but also some notable differences. Um, you know, for example, in the subordinates, uh, there, there's these purple cluster of neurons, um, which show this robust excitation uh, with self port entry and also other port entry, um, but only when the reward is available, not when the reward is not available. So interestingly, it's possible, you know, again, speculation, we're just starting to think about the data for the first time here, but um, I, I speculate that this is a way to think about how subordinates are, are attending more when the reward is present, and um, there's a bigger difference between whether reward is present or not in um, in the representation here. You don't see much of this purple cluster in the dominant animals, for example. Okay, so there's lots to say about this, but I want to make sure I have time to say the important take-home messages here, which I have not gotten to. Um, so you have lots of time. You have lots of time. Oh, okay. Uh, dominance recruit uh, more neurons. So we just use our classic. Um, you know, set a threshold. Is there a phasic response to neuron by neuron? How many of these neurons have a significant response to cues with wins or losses or port entries? And what we found was that dominance overall have um, more neurons uh, within these task relevant ensembles. So, what about the circuit? Um, where are these neurons going? Um, how does this work? Because the prefrontal cortex is already, of course, well established to have mixed selectivity, which we know from um, Earl Miller and uh, Stefano Fusi's work. And you know that to, to you know that to me that basically means that in different contexts, PFC neurons do different things, and they might have a very specified role in one context and a different specified function or role in, a, in another context. And so it's sort of tricky to say there are these types of neurons in the prefrontal cortex. It's um, something that you, you know, probably isn't accurate unless you've done all the tasks in the planet while recording the same neurons, you know, which is impossible. So that's a disclaimer. But um, it's also interesting to think about where different signals are being sent. And if um, there are constraints within mixed selectivity, um, what are those constraints and how do they map differently onto different projections? So to get at this, um, we needed to do some photo tagging. Um, this it, approach is, uh, is developed by Susanna Lima and Tony Zader's lab, um, you know, at this point over a decade ago. Uh, and it was called Photo Stimulation Assisted Identification of Neural Populations, um, which, you know, now we just call photo tagging. But basically the idea is we have an electrode. Um, uh, I think this is... This is a different kind of probe than Nancy has, but it doesn't matter. And, and then this optical fiber where we can deliver light, we will express opsin, a blue, you know, some sort of light sensitive opsin. In this case, we use channel word opsin into these neurons using a projection specific dual virus approach. So um, we use sort of um, a virus that travels retrogradely from the target and, and teragradely 
from a different virus that travels integrally from the source. And then there's a recombination allowing for channel loss of expression only in that pathway, in that projection. And um, then we can record the neuron activity of this, you know, this task. Neuron A fires, we've got that. Neuron B fires, we've got that too. We're just recording what these neurons do without any, any you know, manipulations yet. And then uh, at the end of the session, we can photo tag by just playing some light pulses. And this allows us to see which neurons respond to light. Um, and this is essentially photo tagging. So if it's not responsive to light, it might look like this. And if it is photo responsive, it might look like this. Um, a very important caveat, uh, I started skipping this and then I regretted it, so I'm going to always say these caveats, especially when we're recording in regions with recurrent excitation like the prefrontal cortex. Um, you have your channel adopts an expressing neuron, uh, but there also could be non-expressing neighbors that aren't receiving input, but also non-expressing neighbors that are receiving input. And so um, when you shine the light and make this neuron fire, how do we know that this neuron like that neurons that are firing are not simply receiving input from these CHR2 expressing cells. And one way we can get at that is to um, record ex vivo. Sorry, this is an example from a previously published paper by Anna Baylor, a former postdoc in my lab who is now faculty at Bordeaux. And um, um, what Anna showed is that you could patch and then find different um, latency thresholds, exploring light power density, and determine whether you can even do photo tagging in your preparation. And so sometimes there are several projects in the lab where we have found that it's not possible. But when it is possible, we have our non-expressing uh, non neighbors. And this is this on this y-axis, I wrote photo response threshold. It's really milliseconds latency, how long from when the light pulse happens to when you get the, the response. And what the ideal situation is it's completely non-overlapping populations, um, which we, we see actually pretty often. Um, it gets a little murkier when there's partially overlapping populations because then, you know, what are you going to do? You draw the line here and then have a bunch of false negatives um, or draw the lines somewhere else and risk having false positives. Uh, it gets tricky and then sometimes it overlaps so much that, you know, this is just not a viable approach. Um, we locked out this time and we're more in, in this this zone. So I'll just say that. And um, what we see is that um, overall, more PFC neurons that projected the lateral hypothalamus uh, seem to encode port entry. And we were looking at prefrontal cortical neurons that either projected to the lateral hypothalamus, um, a region that we've seen in the past to be important, yes, for feeding behavior, but also social behaviors. Um, we think this could be a potential control center. Um, or, you know, the basal lateral amygdala, my, my familiar friend and home, um, where, you know, we, we, it's kind of like a default default uh, region for us to investigate um, and seeing what happens in the basal lateral amygdala, which is, of course, known to be very important for associative memory and some might also say for social rank. So this is what we found. And, okay, so, yeah, what does that really mean? You know, I don't know what to make of that. Those, that bar chart wasn't particularly impressive, Kay. Like, um, am I supposed to be wowed by that bar chart? And, you know, I'm not wowed by it either. But if it's true that information from the prefrontal cortex, uh, prefrontal cortical neurons projecting to the lateral hypothalamus are indeed critical for social rank, then manipulating this circuit should alter rank and rank-related behavior. And so um, we, you know, did our, our sort of bread and butter optogenetic experiment um, just photostimulating PFC terminals in the lateral hypothalamus and um, um, looking at this behavior in the same competition task I just told you about. Here we had a five minute epochs with photostimulation and then a longer epochs without photostimulation during, throughout uh, tones and, and reward are being delivered as before. And what we can see is that if we look at the number of rewards or at the proportion of port occupation during the tone, we see an increase in CHR2 animals, but not in EYFP animals. And so um, this just says, oh, eh, sorry, new slide deck, it's rough. I told you it was gonna be rough. Um, okay, so it's significantly uh, promoting dominance behavior. 
But, you know, we also know that the prefrontal cortex is really important for effort. And there's a lot of beautiful papers on, on, on the role of the prefrontal cortex in effort. So we wanted to make sure that that wasn't what we were just seeing. Like maybe the animals are just more willing to exert effort in general, including dominance behaviors and pushing for the port. But, you know, is this really specific to social rank and not just, you know, willingness to put out effort? Um, and so we actually used an effort choice based TAs. And I think um, um, Sebastian Hausman and Mackenzie Paterino really deserve a lot of credit here as well. Um, and of course, Nancy. But they, they definitely were intellectual driving forces uh, in this task. And what, what um, we found here was really nothing. So regardless of whether it was a large wall or a small wall, um, there's a low reward on one side, there's a high reward behind the wall. Um, photo simulation doesn't increase you know, the willingness to put out effort in terms of uh, as measured by wall climbing. We also don't see any change in the latency to pick up the rewards when the animals are alone um, when photo stimulating. So as far as we can tell, this does seem specific to dominance behaviors. Um, if anyone has any ideas for further controls that we could do, please let us know. Um, and with that, I'll just summarize my takeaways. Um, did pretty good on time for my first run through. I'm proud of myself. Almost, almost, almost in time, not too over. But uh, takeaways, PFC neurons decode wins and losses before they even happen, before the trial even begins. PFC neurons more accurately decode social rank than winning, which to me was just exciting. And then both um, PFC BLA and PFC LH neurons show task relevant firing, but PFC LH neurons showed more port entry encoding, more entering the port um, um, during the score reward competition task. And so we explored that and we found that indeed PFC LH neurons are sufficient to promote dominance behavior. And so um, I'll just summarize and remind you one more time what we're thinking right now. This is again, speculation, but based on Stephen Alsop's paper, cell paper in 2018, um, I, I'm, I'm currently thinking of uh, my working model is that the anterior cingulate cortex is playing a role in the checker system. And of course it's possible that these components of the circuit of the functional circuit don't actually sit tidally in like one brain region. So this is, you know, kind of a, some oversimplification. Um, we think that rank uh, is represented in the PFC um, and that uh, this information is being sent to the control center, which identifies deficits. We have, um, you know, actually a lot of evidence that these LH neurons synapse robustly onto DRN dopamine neurons, making this a perfectly poised circuit to um, be our social homeostatic circuit. So again, there's a lot more work that needs to be done to firm this up. This is kind of my um, working model. And uh, with that, I want to uh, close by saying that, you know, it's a crazy time in the world right now. And um, there's a lot of different things that are making different feelings happen. But I, um, I, I want to look towards the future. And uh, one thing that I'm really excited about is that Salk is going to continue having an open fellows search. And um, we've pushed back the deadline to um, enable having a more diverse uh, applicant pool. And we've, we've pushed that to August 1st. Although if you have any special accommodations necessary, just uh, let me know or write that into your application. And then finally, of course, I want to thank everybody on my amazing, amazing team. So many people have contributed to this project. Um, Kanha Batra has done beautiful work, some of which I didn't have time to talk about today. I'm um, looking at HMM, GLM, um, ways to decode behavior uh, with a much richer behavioral readout. Um, Matilda Borio, Mackenzie Lemieux, Jillian Matthews, Ray Raimondo Miranda have all done some really important work on the DRN tip, uh, as well as, you know, Everybody, everybody helps everybody on everything, but um, primarily that. Rachel Rock has done, um, has been with us for several years and does all this meticulous video scoring and annotation and draws lovely pictures of rodents. And Nancy Padilla Coriano, as I already mentioned before, is really the driving force here. The um, um, and Mackenzie Paterino, who I also already mentioned, has been instrumental in collecting these data. Um, past lab members, Sebastian Hausman, um, Javier Weddington, Rihan Zhang, for a few people that I've mentioned, really contributed heavily to this project. Um, and our um, collaborator, Siwu Lu, I also should mention Ila Feet was very helpful in us thinking about how to visualize these data. And with that, I will thank all my collaborators and my funding sources and you for your attention. Thank you very much. 
that was a lovely talk. Lots to think about for me. Uh, there's a bunch of people who have asked questions throughout your talk. Um, you can look at these questions or I can read them to you. Uh, the most voted on question is, what's the meaning of the distance traveled in the PCA space? Um, and a little below that also, what's the temporal resolution of the trajectories that you're recording? Okay, so the first question, um, uh, should, I, should I bring up my slide again? Am I still sharing? Sure, yeah, yeah, we can still see your screen. Yeah, okay, whoops. Do, 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 trajectories, where are they? So just so that we can have everybody looking at it while we're talking about it. Um, so the meaning of the distance, you mean the distance traveled or the distance between? Um, uh, I suppose both, hard to say from the question. So, so, so once again, we are in principal component space. This is state space. This is not necessarily like, firing rate but um you know well it's, it's taking all the all the different firing rates of all the neurons and then looking at what are the different sources of covariance um if many neurons are doing the same thing then that is going to be something that um comes up if many neurons aren't doing much then the trajectories like if you had if you had uh, a bunch of neurons that were exactly flat, like firing at pacemaker um, pacemaker rates, you would just have like dots, you know. Um, and so, what the initial starting location indicates is the state of the ensemble at that time point, um, the 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 rate at which we're moving to, to, through the trajectories. I just did some keynote animations. That's not like the right movie. It's not like played to scale or anything. The, the dots here are 50 millisecond bins. So that's what you should pay attention to. I just tried to show you directionality of my, you know, keynote wipe. So sorry, that wasn't to scale, but um, the timing here is, can be seen here. So it's going boo, 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 and then it goes a little bit faster. And so to me, this is saying that there are dynamic changes happening in the ensemble um, when the queue when the queue begins. So like if I were to pull out, all, if, I, if I were to take all these drones and put out a bunch of perivent raster histograms, I would probably think that this means that there's um, gonna be lots of phasic responses um, on, at the onset of the queue. But it might not be, it might not be excitation, it might not be, it, it could be like a mix of excitation or inhibition or different types of dynamic changes, and then this gets captured in the PCA. So we can also look in the more traditional sense um, at the specific features, which is what the, the cluster mapping is for. But would you have ascribed any meaning to the length of the traje trajectory, well, let's say? Yeah. If... All right, so the distance is, is sort of just like how different at, at those two time points the, the different ensembles are in the overall between space. between trajectories right. but let's say if <laughs> one is length, short the length is something that we are um you know this is something we to be honest we just made up I, it, maybe there's literature on it but we i i wasn't aware of it and we were just thinking about it and we observe you know just looking at the data that that um this is something that we see time and time again where there's really dramatic differences in the length and that seems that seems to indicate how much change there is generally in the ensemble in the individual neurons so you know if you again if you took 100 neurons that had no change in firing rate put them in here you just have dots so that's like the extreme and so uh the greater length means more dynamic change um how many neurons are you sampling from for these tasks um i will i don't know by heart but nancy wrote it here somewhere do, 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 do. um uh, 421 and 373 for dominance and subordinates, respectively. Um, and someone is asking whether the first two principal components are really enough to look at this behavior or whether you would have to look at a more complete uh, set of, uh, of uh, well, the complete eigen. Now, that's a great question. That's a great question. And, um, you know, in, in, in our paper, we'll probably show um, we, we, we definitely need to quantify. Well, one thing we should do, and in the manuscript when we write it, it will include this, will be um, how much of the information is being accounted for by each PC. So, like, you know, if we just look at the first two PCs and that counts for 80% versus 60% or whatever, then, you know, those, those indications would be useful and we would report them. And we can also plot in up to three PCs. Um, but it's pretty standard to to look at two PCs, and it's true, you you might not 
you might not necessarily see them. You might need that third PC, but there are a lot of changes we can already see just in those first two PCs. So it's just kind of a, a, a call on visualization simplification. I mean, like it'd be ideal to see it in 400 dimensional space, but yeah, it's hard. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so there's a bunch of other questions about the alpha tracker. Oh yeah. Um, so th these are rather technical sometimes, but maybe it doesn't matter. Sure. Uh, the alpha tracker, um, can it detect mice that are obscured by bedding or partially hidden from view, or what happens when the mice are climbing on top of one another? That's exactly, that's a great question. And honestly, I think that's the thing, that's the strength of alpha tracker. Um, it's, it's pretty, you know, lots of these other tools, if the animals aren't climbing on top of each other, it, it's, um, it's not a problem. But you can see here, we're even beginning this video with an occlusion, right? And so there, sometimes when, when there's no markings and they're black, they're, they're going to be some errors. Um, these errors are essentially on par with human performance. Um, and so there are, we do have a manual tool that you can do some post hoc correction. If there's, if animals fight, for example, sometimes they separate and, you know, humans cannot necessarily distinguish these two mice after they fought and separated. And of course the tool is also going to fail to do so. But um, there are a lot of little things you, you may have noticed that we did some uh, fur dyeing that is both for the human score and the computational vision tool, the computer vision tool to do a better job. Um, so that's kind of one of the workarounds, but it does work with other mice. And, and when they call over each other, you might get an occasional error um, that is sort of on par with human performance, but we have ways that you can go back and correct them. And it's still, you know, still aut aut automating most of the work. So um, Someone asked whether you need any human coded trials for, for, for this to work at all, or is it totally unsupervised? So can you say that again? Is it? Do you need a human coded trials for this thing oh, to yes. learn? Annotation. You do. You do need to include a training data set that has annotated files. Yes. There's no markers on the animals, so it's markerless. But you do have to put in training data. I mean, like for example, if you wanted to do take take this that was trained on mice and use it on marmosets or Drosophila, you would need to put some marmo like I would expect that you would need to put sure. marmoset sure. or Drosophila training data in, for example. But yeah. it work. Um, someone asked whether social rank is fixed uh, or whether it can be altered by environmental or internal state. Um, and then someone else also referred to the sex of the mouse, whether you tried this with different combinations and whether you see differences in the trajectory of the activity. Well, great questions. And so um, rank is definitely something that you can change. So I guess, are you asking if when we do these manipulations, we can cause a permanent change in rank? Because um, we don't know, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how long the changes in rank may last. Uh, Hylan, who's done some work on that and shows that if you do many, many different photo simulations and induce plasticity, then you might be getting some lasting changes. Um, but, uh, if you're asking if in the wild or in the natural state there are rank reorganizations, the answer is yes. In fact, James Curley has shown that if you um, remove the alpha, this is the CD1 mice though, that's the caveat, but if you remove the alpha within three minutes, the betas and gammas will detect a power vacuum and begin to vie for the throne. And so that is a really interesting phenomenon that um, I would love to study, but I don't quite I'm really, you know, conceptualize how, how you could study it yet. But um, reorganization definitely is something that we use. In fact, it's a necessary function to be able to disentangle the confounded variables of identity and rank. So if you can't reorganize ranks, that's a big problem. In fact, there's this whole other part of um, Nancy's project um, where we are taking animals that are ranked in cages and then taking the two dominants in one cage and pairing them with the two dominants of the other cage and then putting all the subordinates together so that there has to be re rank reorganization. You know, so like that is one experiment that we're doing and seeing how um, that changes uh, representation. But that's a little bit of, um, you know, it's, we, we don't quite have all the data in, or at least not sufficiently analyzed to be conclusive just yet. But um, that experiment I'm really excited about. So, do you, do you think the memory of the rank? So, I'm, I'm assuming that the mice remember where their rank is when you put them into the cage again and again and again. Do you think the memory for their rank resides in PFC, or is that recruited from somewhere else? Um, that's a really good question. I, I. I don't know the answer. Um, like, it's definitely possible that that could be represented somewhere else and then sent to PFC. We don't have any evidence against that. Um, I guess my working model is that it is in the PFC, but it, based on, you know, 
a few different a few different data sets though none of them it's it's, it's possible that it's being sent from somewhere else um Helen, whose work would say medial dorsal thalamus perhaps but that might just be any strong glutamatergic input to the pfc i'm i'm not sure if that's that's a unique input um yet um I don't, did i answer the question yeah 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 i mean it's a hard question to answer right whether whether it's being recruited from elsewhere or not, you'd have to yeah. have access to the entire. And there's another question about sex. Um, so we looked really briefly up at this sort of, you know, not, it was a long time. I don't want to trivialize the amount of effort that was put into it, but um, we did some pilots with females and females just uh, don't form the same robust hierarchies that males do. And so for studying social rank, we decided to stop doing that, although, um, we have other projects that are focused on social behavior and females. Um, yeah, I would say, wouldn't it be more interesting to look at switching hierarchies because you can constantly see, or you could, you might be able to see the trajectories changing all over the place. Yes, exactly. You know, that's, that's exactly the idea. So, you know, when animals are alone versus when they're being put with different animals, all the same sort of recording session, we can see what the same neurons are doing in response to dominant or subordinate animals. And that's, those data are still being analyzed slash digested by my own brain. <laughs> uh, it wasn't ready for prime time yet. Yeah, all right. Um, so there's a few questions that I have a little hard time parsing. Um, <laughs> so uh, one is rather long. There is some work, I can't recall the researchers, that indicates that the alpha character typically has higher stress than beta character. The stress mm -hmm. follows from being challenged almost all the time because the other members want the benefits of being at the top. What would be a reasonable explanation for an alpha character not being as happy as a beta character under isolation conditions, given that it's um, presumably- So, so actually that, um, there, you know, there's been some work on that. And I think uh, there have been a few different studies. I'm thinking definitely of Sapolsky, um, but um, the, there have been a few papers on it. And I think that, uh, that there are conditions and where there's a lot of, of challenging, and then there is there is high glucocorticoids and CRF. Um, but what Robert Sapolsky showed is that uh, dominance, even though they might have higher peak stress, especially because they're being challenged, they return back to baseline much faster. Whereas subordinates have a much higher basal stress level, and um, this is maintained, and they don't recover from confrontations as quickly. So after a confrontation with another animal, subordinates will sort of maintain a high um, blood glucocorticoid level uh, or CRF level. I might, I might have messed that up, but um, higher stress level. And I think that it depends how you, how you quantify it. Um, but yeah, the max amplitude is probably going to be bigger for alphas, but it's going to depend on how many challenges there are. In a very stable hierarchy where there are no, there are no challenges, um, which we find like, you know, when you put the animals into a new cage, there's a lot of, of, of fighting and a lot of challenging. And then after they're housed a little bit longer, they stabilize and there's 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 no fighting. But then there's a cage change, it's the new territory, there's lots of fighting. So so when there's no fighting, I mean, what, it seems like it would be less stressful to be the dominant. You get all the food, you make with the females, you just, I don't know. It, it, it's only when there's, um, there's challenging. And then that the response to stress is, is much more acute and recovers more quickly than for subordinates. Yeah. Um, someone asked about um, footprint of other things that the mouse is doing. So someone recently showed that basically motor activity is everywhere in the brain. I think Kirsten Stewart, mm -hmm. right? And Churchland. Uh, is that uh, yeah, her too, I suppose. Oh. Um, so do you see do you see anything like that? Um, do I uh, see anything like what? Uh, so. Uh, could you observe differences in a PFC activity that could be explained by differences in locomotion? Um, so, uh, I'm just thinking about the way that that is phrased. Um, is there any component of what we're looking at that is related to, to locomotion or premotor planning or anything like that? It's yeah. possible. Um, the way that we've designed the task though, because the cue is being presented you know, at arbitrary times, and it's unexpected by the animal, that should help us with not having motor controls at least um, at the, in this baseline and then pre queue period. So the idea is to uh, initiate a competition state without 
and having some period of time before the animals are actually pushing against each other, because of course that's going to be represented everywhere. Um, but we have this representation of rank even when the animals are in the ITI, even before the cue has been played and they've started to compete. So I think that for me was the um, uh, most compelling feature of that of that analysis. Okay. Um, so I think last question before we cut it, is there a GitHub or a paper for the alpha tracker yet? You said no, but... Um... It is coming very, very soon. Um, I think that uh, it was initially supposed to be out in March, but um, um, there's this global pandemic and it kind of like messed it up a little bit. So yeah. we're, it's, we're working on it. And I think right now we're just... Uh, we're basically just trying to finalize the GUI so that it's user friendly because we just want to make sure that it's as functional as possible. But um, if people want to use it, I, I should I can discuss with my collaborator and see um, about releasing it before the GUI is done. Yeah. If people want it. I don't know. I, I think I would like to wait, but it's true. If it's going to take forever, then then maybe we should just re release it. It's it's slightly they can, less. They can contact you offline, I suppose. For a, yeah, I'll I'll. I'll um, talk with my collaborator and see what he thinks. All right. Okay, I think this is it. Um, okay, thank you so much. Thanks for thank joining us. Thank you very much well. again. Um, I'll cut the broadcast now, and then I'll be in touch about uh, one-on-ones right okay. after. Um, sure. But before that, thanks again. Um, thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Stay tuned for more talks on World Wide Miro, and um, see you on the other side. All right. Bye. Bye.